Okay, folks, let me know uh, if you guys can hear me well and see me well. If you guys can hear me well and see me well, put something in the chat box that you guys can hear me and see me well so we can get started. And I have to download some stuff here. So we have something to use tonight. All right, we're good. Okay, guys, very good. So, uh, okay, you guys can hear me and see me well. All right, so let's get started. And uh, tonight, what I want to cover with you guys is a very interesting feature or function uh, called hashing or cryptographic hashes. And this is something that if you're studying for your for your CISSP, it's it's vital that you know what it does, what it means. And I just I just don't want to give you a definition of what exactly is it. I want to actually explain it to you and you'll see exactly what it is and what it means. So that's what we're going to be doing uh, for this particular night here. So let's go ahead and uh, get started and knock this out. So I'm Andrew Ramdial and uh, I am one of the instructors here at TIA and I teach a lot of CISSP class. So once in a while, I'll teach like a security plus, but I teach a, a lot of CISSP, not very recently. So I have a colleague that does that. So let's go ahead and get started with this. So cryptographic hashes. Now, I'm not sure if you guys had the ability to take a look at my previous videos. As I did videos on symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption. So we had symmetric and asymmetric. And now tonight, we're going to cover uh, symmetric encryption, uh, cryptographic hashes. So let's take a look at that. Okay, let me just uh, check my stream here. Somebody says the stream is uh, having a little bit of an issue here. Let's see. No, nope. YouTube says the stream is okay. Yeah, it looks fine to me. Yeah, it looks good to me. It doesn't see um, any errors. Yeah, all okay. Yeah, everything seems okay. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, knock this out here. Hold on a second, guys. Yeah, the stream is fine. I have a... Uh, so I know a lot of you guys have, uh, uh, you know, a lot of folks attending was some of our students here at TIA. Uh, so if you have taken my class before, uh, you've seen this before. You know, if you haven't taken a class in before, you'll you'll see how unique it is, how unique I teach it. So, all right, let's go ahead and uh, get started on that. So, cryptographic hashes. Let's talk about this. So, one of uh, hopefully again you took a look at the videos I did for symmetric and asymmetric encryption, because I'm going to need you guys to know a little bit about that in this particular session. And then what we're going to be doing is we're going to be covering the, something that goes beyond this. If you were studying in your CISSP official study guide, you would have seen that they had symmetric, asymmetric, and then the, the next topic they had was cryptographic hashes. So let's get started right now from right here. So what exactly is a hash? Well, a, a, a cryptographic hash is basically a function. Um, uh, it's basically it's basically a cryptographic function. <clears throat> that determines if data has been modified. And the best way to show a cryptographic or to talk about cryptographic hashes is actually just to show it to you. And I want to, it's, you know, every time I teach hashing, I always show people a hash. It just makes it easier for you guys to understand what the hell is a hash function. And then you'll see, like, if you've read your books before, um, if you've read your books before, you would have seen that it talks about integrity quite often. Okay, so I'm going to go to, oops, I forgot to share my screen there. So I'm going to go to Google here, and I'm going to type MD5 password. And the reason why I did that is because I want to bring up a site. I want to bring up a hash generator site. So I'm going to go here, and I'm going to say MD5 hash generator. Now, MD5 is a very famous but it's really old. It's a really old hash function. Um, but the concepts of it applies to all hashing functions. 
So in this particular one, this is going to show me the hash. So what I'm going to do is I want to show it to you. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to type, um, I have many certifications. Now, this is my data and this is the hash function. So what a hash function is, it's basically a cryptographic value that tells you if this data has been modified or represents that data. If this data changes, this hash will change. That is the point or that is the idea of a basically a hash. So if I go in here and I just modify this, and this is, you know, make this bigger here, make it easy to see. So if I just change this data in here, you'll notice that the hash will change. So if I go in here and I say, I have over 60 certifications. So if I go in there and I just put that in, now I have a, a bigger statement. You'll notice that the hash was changing. That's every time I type. In fact, I made a mistake when I was typing here. See if I go in here and I click here and I just press space, you'll notice that the entire hash changed. And there is no two, somebody's asking me a question. Uh, it's wise. Okay, you know what, hold on to that question. I'll come to that later. So there is no two messages that will produce this, two different messages that produce the same hash. Every, in theory, and I'll explain that to you a little bit later. But right now, what you guys need to know is every single message will have a unique hash value. In theory, all right, there are times when two different messages that have the same value, and that's called a birthday attack, and that's something I'll talk about a little bit later. But so in, in theory, every single message that you type should have a different hash value. So if I go here and I say maybe I have 63 certifications, you'll notice the hash value changes. For example, I want you guys just select any character in here, any character that you want of this value that you see on the screen here. If I go in here and I just put a space, you'll notice it pretty much changed, right? So every time I change the, the, the plain text, every time I change the message, the hash changes. That's the whole purpose of hashing. Basically, this hash, this basic hash, or what's also known as a digest, this digest or hash represents this data. If this data is modified, the hash will be modified. That is all hashes. It's really nothing more than that. And a lot of people think it's more complex than this, but it isn't. That's all it is. One of the most famous hash we have is SHA-256, or the secure hashing algorithm 256. So if you look at this one, it's gonna it's it's basically like MD5, just bigger. Watch. So if I go in there and it says I have many certification, C E R T I F I C you'll notice it's basically a hash, except that it's a very big hash. This is 256 bit. Why does it look so weird? Because it's written in a hexadecimal. If you look at this one, this is 128 bits, and this one here is basically also in a hexadecimal. That's why they look so weird. But just remember, just the value. So a hash feature. Now let's talk about this and what do you need to know for your test? Because this is really all this is. A couple, couple quick points that you need to know about a hash. A hash is basically something that helps you to identify if a message has changed. If the message changes, the hash will change with it. So when do we use hashes? Well, we use hashes when we send messages. So let's say I send you a secret message over an email, which is something that's sent in plain text. Let's say I sent you a message that says the answer to all the questions on the exam is C. Uh, that's a secret message between us. And I send you a hash in a separate in a separate manner. Maybe I called you and gave you the hash over the phone. When you receive the email, you wanted to verify, is that the actual message that Andrew sent me? Or did somebody mo cap capture it and modify it during transmission? Well, what you would do is you would take the message and hash it, and it should match the exact, the hash that you get should match the exact hash that I sent you. Every single time that message is hashed by that function, it will produce the same hash. Let me show you what I mean. So. Look at this right here. I have many certifications. I have over 63 certifications. Notice the extra space here because if I remove it, notice the hash change. So these two sentences 
has this particular hash. But if I go and I say, give me MD5 online, I'm just gonna use another website. I wanna show you something. No, I don't like that one. Uh, okay, let's use this one. So if I go here and I give it the same message and have MD5 hash the same message, a different website, in theory, it should give us the same hash. Let's see if that's true or not. So I say generate and the hash here I have is D2E and it ends in 81F2. So let's see if that's just right. So we get D2E, um, 81F2, so it's the same hash. So what I'm trying to tell you is every single time that you hash a message with that hash and function, it should always give you the exact same hash, unless if the message changes. So if I go in here and I said I only had 60 certification, now obviously the hash will change. So that is the main point of a hash. Once again, detected messages has been changed. This for your exam provides all of integrity. So when people think of hashes, you think integrity. Why? Because message change, hash change. Message change, I can detect the message has actually changed. So all it's all about integrity. Now there are some other things here we should know about a hash. Hashing is known to take data of any input, data sizes of any input, and output a fixed length hash. So what does that mean? Well, we could take data that's one character to terabytes of data, and you always end up in the same size hash. Watch what I mean. So if I go in here and I start typing more and more data, let's copy all this text here so we can have a lot of data sets. If I go in here and I type more data, you'll notice that every time I type, the hash will change, correct, all right? Just put that sentence again. But what's not changing is the length of the hash. So the length of the hash doesn't, the, the hash doesn't get bigger and it doesn't, it doesn't get smaller. Whether you're talking about a single character like Z, like I press on a keyboard, notice it's the same length, or I have all of these characters, doesn't matter. The hash will stay at 128 bit. So when you're studying and you see something that says, uh, it takes data of any input and outputs a fixed length hash. Now you know what it means, right? So any size of data can give you a fixed length hash, always 128 bits. Now, when it comes to where do we use this? Well, obviously, you know we're going to use this in message transmission to see if data has been modified. But one of the two most common usage of hashing, uh, of hashing is what's known as a cryptographic signatures or digital signatures and passwords. Passwords are hashed. In fact, no computer should ever store a password in plain text. When you create a user account on a computer, what do you do? You put in the username when you create an account and you give it a password, right? You, let's say to put the password as password. And then when you say create the user account, it then hashes the password and stores the cryptographic hash of that password. So the computer doesn't store the path, the plain text password, it stores the hash of the password. Now why does it do that? Because you see, hashing is considered one way. And that's another important concept of a hash you need to understand. If somebody ever steals your hash, they should never be able to turn the hash back into the plain text. That's something that's a no-no. Unlike other cryptography, where you have the symmetric key and the asymmetric key, you encrypt and decrypt. There's no encryption and decryption with a hash function. There is no, quote unquote, really a key. There is just the plain text or the message and the hash and a function in between it, like MD5 or SHA-256 or SHA-384, whatever it is that you're using. So that's one thing you gotta remember. You can't go back. So for example, I should never be able to take this hash and decrypt it of some kind into this message. That's what you can't do it. In theory, it's not even possible because what if this message is something like one, I don't know, one terabyte? One terabyte is an amazing amount of data. Even if it's one megabyte, one megabyte is it's eight bits in a byte, if you know this, eight bits in a byte, 32 million bits, 32 million ones and zeros is, is eight megabytes. So, and this is 128 bits. You can't take 128 bits and turn it back into eight, turn, turn it back into, actually one megabyte is eight million bits. 
You can't trade at 8 million bits. It's not possible. So the point I'm trying to tell you is one way. They should never be able to take the hash and turn it back into the message. So that's another properties of a hash function that you should be familiar with for your exam. Uh, another thing here that we're going to know for our exam when it comes to hash functions is we should actually know what functions they're talking about. What what are the hash functions that we should be familiar with? Now, when it comes to the CISSP exam, you should really understand that hashing deals with integrity. Hashing deals with modification of information. Hashing does not stop someone from modifying data. If you hash the data, it doesn't stop somebody from modifying it. To stop someone from modifying data, that would be access control. That would be like Windows permission. But in order to detect if the data has been modified, that's what hashing does. So you got to be careful when you read the question. If the question is something like, what's going to prevent modification? Hashing doesn't really prevent it. It only detects it. So it's more of a detected thing. If you put Windows permission on it, and the guy tries to double click on the file and he can't edit the file, now you're preventing the modification of the data. So remember that for your exam. Now, when it comes to the functions, for your CISSP exam, I really don't think you're going to have to memorize the algorithms. Now, I, I went through the study guide. Yeah, this is going to be the Cybex official guide, which I highly recommend. Really good book. And um, I took out the table that's there, and I, and I kind of redrew it here to show you some of the, the hash and algorithms that are out there. Now, for your exam, you're not going to worry about the difference between them as your exam is more high level. All you really should know is, hey, these are some hashing algorithms. And they, they're, they're pretty easy to memorize. I don't think they were that difficult to memorize. Um, so here is a, uh, here's a table that I got out of your book. And you're basically going to know a couple of them. So you have something that's called, very famous, is the SHA or the secure hashing algorithm this family of hashing algorithms. And the difference between them is just generally the size of that, the length or the size of the hash. And I'll explain why the, the length of the hash matters in a minute. You have a couple here at the bottom that just gets a little bit bigger. MD5 is the one I showed you. This was a very popular one that was used and this thing was compromised. I'm gonna talk about what's called a collision in a minute. And this here you shouldn't use as that's been compromised. And I'll explain why that is in a minute. H, Mac, of all, or some other ones here uh, that is out there. So these are going to be some of the ones that you should be familiar with that's going to be doing hashing. Now, you'll notice that they come in different sizes, all right? This is, I do want to point out, 160, 224, 286, 384, 512. And what this means is the hash values are different. But what is, what, what, you're probably saying, so why are they different values in hashing? Well, when you do a bigger hash, such as we sh I showed you guys SHA-256 is a very large hash. If I do SHA-512, I'll put a message here. You'll notice this thing is gigantic. It's 512 bits. Why do we have such large hash functions? Um, and this is what uh, Yasser is asking me. So are there any advantage to a larger hash functions? Well, let's talk. There is something you need to know for your exam. That's really important. So I started out this by saying that no two messages should ever have the same hash. Remember that? Remember I said that? And I said in theory, no two messages should have the same hash. Well, it turns out that they could. Okay, here's why. So I told you you can take a message of unlimited size, any size, from, from one bit to trillions and trillions and trillions of bits. You can take messages of any size and produce what is known as a fixed length hash. So what exactly is that? So that's the 128, the 256, the 384. Now, if your hash value is too small, you will have different data with the same hash. An example, let me show you something. This is, now it's not gonna happen, but I'm gonna show you what I mean. This is, it makes it easier. To learn. Let's say, okay, let's say your message is car and it has this value. And then somebody else comes and type the word van and it produced the same value as car. Okay, now in theory, this is very difficult to happen, but if 
the two messages, if car and van is giving you the same damn hash function, this is called a collision. Okay? So collisions is when two different messages, like car and van, produces the same hash. This is called a hash collision. Now, this is not good. This is used in what's known as a birthday attack. If you've studied your CISP, you've studied your, your, what has a birthday attack? And I'll explain more down in a minute. So in order to stop, and, and the reason for this happening is because you have unlimited input to a fixed number of outputs. Remember, if there's only 128 hashes, then how many combination of hashes do you have? Well, it's two because it's binary to 128. There, and it's a big number. Yeah, it's a number with like 38 zeros or something like that. Two to 120 is a giant number. Uh, but because you have unlimited amount of inputs, right? Any input size to fixed length output. At some point, you will have two messages with the same hash. And that's what happened with MD5. In fact, MD5 is not even SHA-1. MD5 is known to collision attacks. And collision is when two different messages, once again, have the same hash. Now, this is well documented in what is known as the birthday attack. Uh, this is more in password cracking, but uh, I'm going to cover that. All right, so I'm going to show you guys what is the birthday attack. So Matt's asking me, uh, so Matt's asking me, I thought that would, it is a birthday attack. Cash collisions. Now, if you guys are ever wondering, and I've you know I've taught this class a billion times, and people have always asked me, what the hell is a birthday attack? I've heard about it. What is it? Well, now you know what it is. But why is it called a birthday attack? Right? What the hell is that? Well, let me show you something. So, you know what? Let me ask you a question. If I put 30 people in a room, what is the probability that any two people have the exact same birthday? Not year, just month and day. Okay? Now, it seems you have 365 combinations. There's 30 people in a room, and if you, you know, what's the probability that any two people here have the same birthday? Like, let's say September 1st, right? So you go around a room, you ask everybody their birthday, and then you, you say, and then you look at the paper and you try to find two of the same. And it seems like you're not going to have a lot, you know, it's going to be very few people that's going to have that. But in actuality, it's high. So some people will say, so I go around a room and I ask my students, well, what do you guys think? Is it 10%? Is it 5%? Is it 50%? Is it 80%? What do you think is a probability that two people have the same birthday? Let's see something. So I'm going to go here, and this is going to blow your minds. I always show students this. Uh, I always show students this probability. Hopefully, it's still on Wikipedia here. No, but this stuff is live, guys. There's no, like, prep in here. So it's still on Wikipedia. So consider an example in which a teacher has a class of 30 students, asks everyone for the birthday to determine whether any two students have the same birthday. This may seem small, and that's the idea. It may seem small. The probability that one student has the same birthday as any other is actually 70%. So it's, it's higher than you thought. So think about this for a second. If you ever have 30 people in a room, and you go around the room and you ask them for the birthdays, more than likely, more than likely, more than according to the math here, 70% likely two people will have the same birthday, even though there's 365 combinations here. Uh, the math says so. Now, this has nothing to do with, oh, it was a leap year or it was a, uh, well, leap year would actually increase it. It has nothing to do with pe more people are born in January or December or, 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 I forgot the month, like October, whatever it is. It's just math. It says 365 combinations. If you need, if you put 30 people in a room, the two, 70% two will have the same attack, the same birthday. Now, what the hell does this have to do with hash and why is it called a birthday attack? Um, so what this has, so what, so what this has to do with hashing is password attacks. And where the birthday attack really hits you is when your password, and this is a theoretical thing, okay, is when your password is car. This is how the birthday attack works. Your, your password is car, C-A-R, all right? So when you want to log into your computer, you type C-A-R, you press enter, and it logs you out. Then one day, I'm the hacker, and I come to you, and I says, let's say your name is Bob. I says, hey, Bob, I cracked your password. It was Van, B-A-N. And you're like, no, it's not that. And I said, yes, it is. Come, let me show you. So I bring you to your computer, and I type 
van and boom, it logs me in as you. And then you log out. I log out and then you log in with car and boom, it logs you in. What the hell is happening here? Remember the computer stores the password as a, as a hash value. And the word car and the word van is producing the same value. That's the birthday attack. The birthday attack affects hashing algorithms or, coll or collisions on hashing algorithms. Uh, and just to go back here, so find a collision of a hash function. So the birthday attack attacks hash functions that are small. If the hash function has a very limited number of potential hashes, that's when you're going to get a lot of collisions. When you have a giant hash, like 256 bits, the collision is less likely. So people say to me, how do I defeat the birthday attack? The way to beat the birthday attack is to increase the number of birthdays, is to don't have 365 combination, have more. In other words, don't limit it to 128 number of hashes, 2 to the 128 number, 128 bit number of hashes. Increase it to 256 bit number of hashes. Now that's not doubling it, that's exponentially doubling it. Exponentially doubling the overall size. Here, remember, 2 to the 128 gives you a value. 2 to the 129 will double that value. 2 to the 130 will double that. By the time you get to 2 to, to, to 26, it's just too big. Collisions are really unlikely when using such a giant hash. In fact, SHA-256 is one of the most used hash functions. It's used in things like cryptocurrency. You ever know this? All, almost all cryptocurrencies use some form of SHA-256. It's used in certificate signing and digital signatures. A secure hashing algorithm utilizes SHA-256. So it's used a lot. And we don't, you know, there's 384, there's 512. We have really large hashes out there. 256 seems to be the one that the internet agrees on that is as secure. You don't want something too big that takes up a lot of computing power. And that's one of the things in cryptography. When the algorithms is too big or the, the functions are too large, they take up too much computing power and defeats the purpose. Of, then it takes too slow to get anything done. Okay, so that is a birthday attack. Um, that is hashing. Does anybody have any questions here for me? If you have a question, put it in the box. I'll get it answered for you. Uh, okay, so Rami says, uh, why no class for CI on Udemy? Not yet. Uh, so are there any advantage or longer? Okay, I did answer that. We did answer that. Okay, this is a good question. Do you have to remember the hash sizes of different hashes? So yes, sir is asking me that. And for your exam, the answer is more than likely going to be no. Uh, I've not heard of any students getting questions on what exactly is the size of this hash. I've had students get questions on integrity or selecting this function. So you should know the function names. Like you should know SHA is a, is a hashing function. You should know MD5 is a habit. You should know AES is a symmetric and RSA is an asymmetric. That's what you should know. But when it comes to like, Values, don't memorize that. I've never really heard a student, not, you know, I've been teaching CI since people 15 years. I've never really heard of people having those questions, not in a, that's five, six years probably. So it's like the 2000, the 2015 exam really cut down a lot on the tech. Uh, but the, you know, the later exams, the current exams, it's not there. Now the CI speed did change. I'm not sure if you guys, you know, they had this, they have a much bigger exam, it is four hour test. The contents didn't change, but the test structure did. Now you have a longer test with more questions. Okay, guys, with that in mind, guys, all right, nobody here else has questions on hashing. So I'm gonna give you guys some, let's do some practice questions, then we'll be done. If you guys know anybody studying for the CISSP and have a problem with hashing, send them this video. Hopefully I can, hopefully I can help them understand what exactly is a hash. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to do some practice questions with you guys. But in the next video, we'll talk about what exactly is a digital signature. Because now we covered symmetric, asymmetric, hashing. Now we can talk, we can start combining stuff and talk digital signatures. Yeah, that's important for your test too. Now, the questions are going to be pretty easy because you, you just covered hashing. So I wanted to show you guys um, how they would ask some questions. 
on cryptographic hashes. All right, so I have about three or four questions on it, and then I have a questions on some other stuff. So let's just do some practice question. Uh, okay, you know what, Yeto, hold that question for a second. Uh, he's asking if SHA-3 is used. We do have a SHA-3, we do. Um, hold that question there for a second. Let me just show you guys some practice questions, then we'll come back and we'll get it answered. Okay, so I'm gonna put the question on the screen and give you guys about a minute to answer it. You can just put the answers in the box. If not, I'll just go over it with you guys. All right, investigators acquired a new hard drive to analyze. What should investigate to ensure data integrity is, uh, then issues is detected. Encrypted using a symmetric key, hash the entire drive, remove confidential data first, a uh, high level format the drive. All right, put the answers in the box. All right, put the answers in the box. All right, guys, 10 seconds more. Okay, guys, very good. Um, all right, so in this one here, it's hashing. I know uh, as acquired a new hard drive, I should have put a new hard drive with data is good. Uh, okay, so the first thing the investigator should do, and if you get questions on your exam that talks about anything that has to ensure that the data, any type of modification to the data is going to, has to be detected or shouldn't happen. Make sure to go with something about hashing in there. So a symmetric key, if he, if he encrypts the data with symmetric key to data, if the data gets modified, you wouldn't really be able to tell. Remove confidential data is modifying the data. Formatting it is erasing it, so that doesn't make sense. Hash the entire contents of the drive, store the hash. So if he modifies the data, remember one of the things we're going to, one of the things that you're going to have to do on your exam is you're going to have to read these words really, really carefully. So, and you will get questions on the chain of custody and forensics. So if you haven't reviewed that, make sure you review that. All right, let's do another question. Data leakage of sensitive information is, I should put, is prevented by using TLS, SHA, WEP, or IMAP. Let me see your, uh, so you guys should understand your algorithms for your tests. All right, put the answers in the box there. Take a minute, guys, and answer this one.
okay guys very good okay so let's take a look um prevent leakage of sensitive information so the answer here is tls this is a trick this is a a tricky one that i put up for you guys because i wanted you guys to to remember something hash and alg so first of all you shouldn't have gone with imap that's a clear text protocol you guys should have also know that web is crackable and web secures wireless um but i do want you guys to remember Hashin does not provide confidentiality. Hashin does not actually encrypt the data. Okay, ha when you encrypt data and you send the data over, no, if you hash data and you send the data over to me, and they had, the data is sent in plain text. If you want to encrypt that data, you would use a symmetric key to encrypt the data. If you watch my last video, uh, I talked about hybrid cryptography. So you would use like hybrid cryptography, the combination of symmetric and asymmetric key to encrypt the data. And then you would use hashing to detect that the data has been modified. So a little bit of a trick question here. I know I was covering hashing, so I put it in there to see if you were really paying attention there. Uh, so remember, TLS, which utilizes a full hybrid encryption system of symmetric to encrypt and asymmetric to pass the symmetric keys, would give you data confidentiality. And you're absolutely right. Um, Yego says SHA would only hash it. It does not provide confidentiality. Okay, for a cloud service provider that stores data, what should they use to detect the unauthorized modification of data? Very similar question to the first one. Okay, so this one here, I thought was pretty easy. If you got the first one, you should have got this one here. So this is a hash function, once again. So just showing you an example of how a question would look. Um, data segregation would be more of confidentiality. HTTP, and these are protocols to access things. This is, SAML would be authorization, authentication. HTTP is just getting web pages, and it's plain text, first of all. Uh, data segregation is what the problem cloud providers do to ensure that you can't see my data. But a hash function is what they can use. they hash your data in the cloud, and if it's unauthorized modified, they'll be able to detect it. All right, let's do practice question four. Which of the following? This is not a hash thing. This is just something here for you. Some additional. Which of the following is the most important consideration of processing person identifiable information? Hash and encrypt and hash the data, store PII, avoid storing PII, following all laws and regulations. Only A will detect the auto is absolutely correct. Okay, guys, let's see what you guys got. We got a lot of these here. So very good. CISSP answer. If you, you know, if you were probably studying your security plus, you'd probably go on with like encrypt and hash the data. But when it comes to the CISSP, you put on your manager cap. You think like the manager. You take, uh, 
you take you take the more default answer. So when I TTI, I tell my students, go with the manager answer. And the manager answer is something generic. It's something more general than the others. It's the answer that includes the others, like following all laws and regulation when encapsulate encrypting the data, s storing it for periods of time, or maybe even avoid storing it depending on the laws and where you are and what type of data it is. A quick tip for your CISSP, if you ever... Uh, if you ever get to a question on an exam, especially the CISSP, and you look at the four choices and you're like debating, maybe you brought it down to two choices and you're debating on which one is better than, than the other. What you do is you go with the most generic choice. Well, does A include B or does B include A? Ask yourself that. If A includes B, A is the answer. B includes A, B is the answer. Just like in this question here, you'll notice that D actually includes A, B, and C, making that the best choice. A quick exam tip there. All right, last question. When is the best time for security personnel to recommend encryption during the SDLC? Testing, development, requirements, definition, operation, and maintenance. Put the answer in the box. When is the best time to recommend encryption? All right, pretty easy one. Let's see what you guys got. Now, this one here, I always give students something. This one here I taught here was pretty easy. Um, let's see, given requirements. Here's a quick trick to your exam. Any, anytime you get a question on SDLC, they all a lot of times on the exam, they give you questions where they're going to say something like, where does security get done? Where should you recommend security? Where should security requirements get done? And then you look at the four choices. Now, one of the things about the SDLC is there's no standardized SDLC and the phase names may not be the exact phase names you see here. Just go with the earliest phase. Always remember something. Security should be done as early as possible. Not something that comes late, but something that comes at the beginning. The earlier security is added in, the better it is for the system. The earlier it's added in, the, m the more likely those requirements will be met. Okay, guys. Hopefully you guys had some fun today. Uh, so let's, let me see if I, if you guys have any questions, put it in the box before I go, I'll try to answer it. Uh, somebody had asked me about SHA-3 and I said I wanted to answer that. So there is a SHA-3, SHA-2 and SHA-3. SHA-3 came out man, five, six years ago, something like that. And it's not so widely deployed as SHA-256. First of all, it is considered to be a little bit slower, especially on what they call general purpose computer. The other thing is that when you're thinking about a lot of software, you know, who determines the functions we use in the software? Uh, is is the programmers. And a lot of time, programmers just keep using what they're using. There's a lot of codes out there that still use a SHA-2. And, and why? Because SHA-2 works. One of the things is, if SHA-2 works and there really hasn't been any vulnerabilities against it, then why change it? And a lot of programmers still use it, but there is a SHA-3 there is a SHA out there. But once again, for your exam, guys, I don't want you guys to go in and know that. Know that there is such a thing as that SHA is a hashing algorithm it has h in there but other than that don't worry too much about bit size and why this one is better than that one your exam is not going to go so far in all right guys very good all right if you guys enjoyed this video guys click on the like button if you haven't done that already subscribe to the channel 
Uh, join me again, hopefully next week. If I get some time, I'll do another video on digital signatures. What, what exactly is a digital signature? How does it work? I'll walk you through the process of a digital signature and um, I'll have some questions on it. So with that in mind, guys, thank you guys for attending. Uh, Yeto is asking, okay, hold on, he's asking another question here. Was there a particular reason they chose four different sizes for SHA-2? And I'm not sure why. You know, it depends on the application and the security of the application. I know there was a 224, a 224, 256, a 384, and a 512. So those were the, the, the four sizes that they have. Uh, I guess different application required different security. But much of the internet pretty much standardized on the 256. The probability of a collision on a 256 is, is, is close to, is not, is, it's not none, but it's pretty much close to it. Uh, the problem, you know, I'm, are you, if you think about this, if you go to two, to 384, there's a probability that if, if 256 degree can come up with a collision on it, is there really a benefit to going to 384 or 512? Think about that for a second. All you're doing is increasing your processing power, you're storing a larger value. Is there, is there really a need for it? And if you're a programmer, Probably not, right? For 99% of our application, maybe if your application is storing super tech secret data, maybe you do want a 512 hash in there. Maybe. You know, it depends who your adversary is. If your adversary is a corporation down the block with $10 million in their bank account, you can probably get away with, and get away with MD5 because they don't have the manpower to break you. But if your adversary is another country with unlimited money, maybe you want to think about up updating your security. Something to think about, right? All right, guys, you guys have a great day, guys. Hopefully, I was entertaining to you guys. If you guys know somebody studying for the CISP, share the video with them. Tell them to join me if, Join me next week. Let's try to do it same time. Do some more practice questions. Get you guys more prepared to pass in your exam. Uh, and if you really like my teaching, hey, sign up for one of my live classes. If you, if you really enjoy it, then I'll see you in the next video, guys. All right, you guys take it easy, guys.